Recording is on. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Jaya Shwebat, and I'm one of the Hindu chaplains in the University of Calgary. I'm also a senator with the University of Calgary, and I did the Hindu chaplaincy at the university three years ago. That's my, and I'm a life member with Hindu Society of Calgary and been very active and actively involved in the society for a long time. That's my background about Hinduism. Uh, my personal professional background is I have two graduate degrees, one in clinical biochemistry and one in classical music of India. And I was a cancer researcher for 27 years in the University of Calgary's research and development. And later on, when I finished my PhD in classical music, I've been visiting many Canadian, American, and European universities teaching classical music of India in the, uh, at various levels in the undergrad uh, levels. And it has been a wonderful journey so far. And I'm really enjoying having this discussion with um, all of you. Uh, so let's start. Great. Well, thank you, Jashri. Now I'll get uh, Dr. Tony Barber to introduce himself here. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm uh, Dr. A.W. Barber. Um, I uh, am also a Buddhist priest. I uh, was ordained in Japan. Um, I teach courses on uh, Asian culture, uh, both South Asia and East Asia. Um, and my research area is primarily Buddhism. Uh, I've um, published extensively uh, in the field uh, and um, actually have a new book uh, coming out uh, in about a month on a dialogue between uh, Christians and Buddhists. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to be able to join uh, with uh, my fellows here and have an interesting discussion about, uh, about emotions and, from the Buddhist perspective. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I'm Father Adrian Martins. I'm uh, the Episcopal Vicar for Lay Associations, as, uh, and I also work as the Ecumenical and Interreligious Coordinator for the Diocese of Calgary. Um, I'm also an associate priest here at Ascension Catholic Parish in North Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And so I thank you for, uh, yeah, for all the great discussions and dialogue we're going to have. Um, so, Jeshuri, uh, since you started here, why don't you kind of give us a, a bit of a summary on the teaching about anger as related to emotions and passion in Hinduism? Okay. Uh... I will take the help of some of the scriptures, some of the readings I've done in the, with the Hindu scriptures. Hindu scriptures say that there are six Aris, that means the enemies of a human mind. And they are Kama, Rodha, Loha, Moha, Madha, Matsaya. Kama is the, the excessive sexual desire, Krodh is anger, Lobha is greed. Moho is excessive temptation, mother is arrogance and excessive egoism, butsar is jealousy and envy. Out of this, the way it works out, growth, that is anger, is one of the six enemies which really destroys a human behavior to its lowest level. It brings it brings the human being to its lowest level. And therefore, a person who cannot control the anger, a person who, who reacts while the person is in a very angry mood, the logic, the rationale of the person is lost completely. And that's why it could destruct, destroy, and completely devastate the person himself and all the people around the person. So that's how the anger is. Now what happens is when we think of emotion and passion, emotion is very much, it's, a, it's something like a sensation. 
It's a strong, crucial sensation. Emotion is to feel. It has a very powerful effect on human behavior. But how does it affect? Well, there are two primary causes, which is one is love, the other one is fear. And I think all the emotions are, I would believe, the variables of these two, love and fear. So when you are, when you, the maternal love, or when you love, or when you are, when you look at your community or society, these are all coming out of the love part of the strong emotion. But as fear, hating somebody, wanting to destroy somebody, basically anger-related activities, they stem from this fear concept of the, of the emotion. When we talk of emotions, many times we get sort of misled or we get a little bit confused between emotion and passion. But actually a powerful state of emotion or a very strong feeling, strong sensation of an emotion is passion. A deep, deep feeling for a person, of a person, is actually the passion. And you know what, in my personal experience, as well as many of the experiences I have read about and I have seen some people, passion has worked more as a driving force to strive for some goal. For example, take my own example. I was very happy working as a researcher in cancer research, but I had this passion for classical music. And I used to say that to my children, to my family members, my husband, that you know what, I don't want to die without pursuing music. Classical music is my passion. I really don't want to die without pursuing and studying it. And sure enough, the emotion about music got so much stronger that I left my research, cancer research field, and I went into graduate school again, did my master's and PhD in classical music. And I would say passion was the founding, the foundation of my pursuit of this particular art. So passion, as people think, has a bad connotation no, it is not. It all depends upon how you handle it. And it, I think it provides you a lot of energy. So that's how I would say passion is. Emotion is basically within yourself. I would say it's almost physical. It's a physical sensation because all of us, not most of us, all of us have a few uh, different kinds of emotions among us, within us. So they are very much a part of our body, if I can go one step and say that. Whereas passion is something coming out of your mind, your heart, and it's very abstract. And a strong form of emotion becomes a passion. So this is how I understand. And emotion or passion, these, they fall in the same category as the six I said earlier, everywhere, when anything goes out of the control, naturally that's a, it has a devastating effect. But to some extent, if it is within control and if it is used for a cause and that cause is for good of everybody, then I think even these so-called human errors or human um, enemies can be your friend. For example, karma. Karma is a desire. But to desire, to limit your desire, something good and apply rationale and logic give you and it will let you achieve your goals. Anger, we always think, oh, anger is so bad. But then, for example, if someone is coming and is attacking your family, your child, or someone in there that you love, you naturally should and would get angry. And at that time, if you take a step to destroy that attacker, that form of anger 
is not a vice, but it works as a virtue because you're protecting, you're defending someone you love or someone who is innocent and who could be a victim of the attack. So even that has a bright um, silver lining, let's say. Same thing is with the rest of the enemies that are described in so much detail in the Hindu scriptures, Loha, Moha, Madha, Matsara, many of these, and that all of these work, if you are putting a logic, if you are having a control on them, and if you are working with those using some rationale. So I would very much say that emotion and passion are the two billions of human mind, but after all, it's up to you and to you as what, how to control, and if it is used and uh, employed for the better of the society, the better of your, of your family, and better for your country too, the patriots we see, all the people who are defending us on the borders, they have to have some form of anger, some form of passion within themselves, then only they can protect and then only they can defend the, big, the, you know, the people, the innocent people within those borders. So now I can quote a spree, but I think I will stop here and listen to uh, you all first before I uh, narrate a small story uh, of uh, Mahabharata. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jayashri. Uh, now, Dr. Tony Barber for Buddhism's view on this. Well, thank you, uh, both of you. Um, <clears throat> Buddhism uh, looks uh, at, uh, at these things uh, in a variety of, of different ways, and how uh, the emotions are classified uh, differs from, say, one Buddhist text to, uh, to another. Um, although they deal with all the same emotions, but they kind of just put them into different categories according to you know, whichever uh, author you, you prefer to, uh, to look at. Um, I'm going to base myself on uh, the, uh, maybe the most authoritative text uh, across Buddhism called uh, the Abhidhamma Kosha. Uh, it was written somewhere around uh, the 4th to 5th century. Uh, and uh, it's very detailed. It's, um, it's very um, uh, well uh, thought of. And um, traditionally, in, in many Buddhist countries, if you were training to be a, um, um, an educated uh, Buddhist uh, priest, um, somewhere at the beginning of your education, you would have started with this text. So uh, probably right after you learned all the rules for being a monk, you would learn you know, some Abhidharma out of uh, this, out of this book. Um, and because, of course, Buddhism uh, was born in uh, India, uh, just like Hinduism, so much of the technical language uh, is shared. Uh, when uh, uh, my esteemed colleague uh, began her um, little dissertation, um, all the Sanskrit terms that she used are very familiar. Uh, because uh, we use the, pretty much the same uh, the same terms um, for, uh, for from the Abhidhamma Kosha, they talk about a number of um, of emotions. Um, so we would have uh, attachment and anger, which I'll get back to. Um, maybe delusion or confusion, something along that lines, right? Um, uh, moha. Um, I think is the, uh, the proper term there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, pride and doubt. And in Buddhism, uh, wrong views uh, is also considered to be a passion. Um, so uh, before I get exactly into the notion of anger, um, I wanted to speak kind of just generally about all of these, um, these emotions. From the Buddhist perspective, perspective, um, these are, um, all of these are thoughts, or maybe, you know, thought systems. Um, but the difference between these thoughts and other thoughts that we have is that these um, come 
uh, are held very closely by our ego or our self. Um, and so they're much more direct, and that's why we often feel them uh, even physically, right? So if we take uh, today's topic, anger, um, normally when you're angry, uh, like your uh, nose will start to flare out and your breathing will be rapid and uh, maybe your, your face will change color uh, and so on, right? Uh, so there's, because this thought is so close to the ego uh, that it has even uh, physical effects where, you know, if like we're thinking about particle physics, it probably doesn't have the same physical effect on, on us. Uh, uh, so, so, but it is, it's just thought. And uh, because it's a thought, it can be dealt with, according to Buddhism, in the same way that we deal with, with many other, many other thoughts, right? Uh, anger uh, in, if we look at the Theravada school, so that's the form of Buddhism you would find in say, Sri Lanka, uh, or uh, Thailand today, although in ancient times it was, uh, of course, all across uh, India and beyond. Um, if we look at um, in, in uh, that system, uh, it's treated as, uh, as, of course, a negative emotion, uh, something that needs to be generally controlled, um, but not much different uh, in its kind of generic level to uh, desire or one of the other um, one of the other emotions in the Mahayana form of Buddhism, which is what you find today in uh, Nepal, Tibet, China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, uh, Mongolia, uh, and elsewhere, um, it takes on a very different significance, and that's because in the Mahayana uh, it has kind of two cornerstones uh, to its tradition. Uh, one, of course, is wisdom, which comes from uh, meditation and, and study of scripture. And the other um, is compassion. Uh, compassion is extremely important in Mahayana. And uh, the Mahayana texts teach that anger uh, is the direct, uh, uh, enemy or opposition to compassion. You know, it's very hard to be compassionate when you're angry at somebody, right? Um, and although uh, we can recognize a kind of um, justifiable anger, uh, you know, if someone's uh, uh, attacking your family member or, um, or uh, your community or something like that, uh, anger might be quite useful uh, and it's it's uh, spoken about, but in general, um, you know, it, it generally has has a negative connotation with it uh, as uh, something that we should learn to to control, uh, even if it if it might be justified. Um, and so, um, the meditation tradition um, tries to put a little bit of space between you. And, uh, and these thoughts, uh, particularly what we would call, you know, the more emotional uh, or um, the passions, using passion in the old sense of the word, um, uh, put a little bit of space there so that, you know, you're a little bit more in control of your emotional state and not your emotional state uh, is in control of you, right? So, uh, road rage is something like you might want to get a little control over, you know, <laughs> although I personally understand it, but, you know, uh, it's not exactly uh, where you want to go, right? <laughs> it doesn't help you get to the other place any faster. Uh, so, um, you know, so a little bit of distance, a little bit of control over your uh, uh, over your um, things. And in particular, because Mahayana puts a lot of emphasis on service to others and compassion for others and, and all of this, uh, then obviously anger uh, is in conflict with that kind of fundamental concept that uh, motivates the entire tradition. Thanks so much, uh, Tony there. That's uh, Dr. Barber. Um, so to just go over kind of quickly here, uh, a little bit uh, similar to both of your talks here around anger, 
is uh, there's a different different ways of looking at it in the Christian tradition. Um, primarily, though, just looking at it from the Western point of view, that there's a tradition within Western Catholicism of always putting anger under temperance. Now, temperance is this idea that we need to have the law of moderation in all things. So, if you go down to sit and have a turkey dinner, uh, you're going to be, I mean, even though it's sort of a feast day, uh, maybe it's Thanksgiving or something like that, you still have to sort of watch your portions because, of course, food has a purpose, and the end purpose of food is sustenance, of course, and joy that it brings you. And so anger, in some senses, is an imbalance of temperance, of, of not doing the right thing or the wisest thing at the right time for the right purpose. And so you see this in the Christian tradition, even in the law of Moses, right at the beginning of the Bible, where the Ten Commandments come down to Moses. And it's, of course, not just the Ten Commandments, but there is very sort of strict dietary laws and other things that Christians would look at this as sort of already kind of teaching the natural law of temperance. And so you also see here, too, this uh, certain laws that were sort of steering people away to be more patient and that, that anger is somewhat of an imbalance. But it's interesting, though, because you get also at the same time, though, this idea that, uh, that anger has its place. So Jesus, when he's in the temple, he sees everyone sort of trying to, to sell things and to use the temple as kind of a means to get money out of poor people and other things. That, I mean, he, he's outraged, first of all, that they've sort of desecrated a holy place. And secondly, they're, they've turned God's temple into this sort of this great ground of selling things. So he overthrows table. He makes a, a whip of cords. And at the same time, though, Jesus is also speaking about anger. He says if, uh, if anyone's angry with their brother or sister and tries to bring a gift to the altar uh, of the temple, I mean, they should leave their gift at the altar and then go and be reconciled with their brother or sister and then come back and offer it. This idea that you can't even sort of have communion with God unless you've sort of forgiven that anger against the other person. And so you get this idea within the New Testament. St. Paul says, be angry, but sin not. Now, of course, he's not kind of encouraging anger, but there is sometimes a place for it. Um, just like kind of temperance is the right balance of things, there's sometimes a time for anger. Um, and so we also get uh, different things in the Christian tradition. For example, in the, uh, the Proverbs, it says, a gentle answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. So again, there's sort of very rare occasions where it would be sort of justified and useful. And indeed, we want to be in control of ourselves and have uh, sort of an understanding of who we are and what we should do at the right time. But at the same time, though, it's sometimes useful uh, if the end is to aim towards the good. And so... How do we actually sort of make this practical within the Western Catholic tradition? Of course, there's different ways of looking at anger. There's the Eastern tradition, which is a little bit different. But the Western tradition generally will always frame it under temperance. The problem, of course, uh, of all sin, at least within the Western tradition of Catholicism, is pride or ego. And so if we're sort of focused on ourselves and what we want, this will lead to a lack of temperance. And so just to give the example again of, of sort of overindulging in foods at a table. Um, again, we'll sort of, we'll go up to the turkey and we'll kind of take off, off three strips of, of, of this. And, and one of the things also that the church father said is that it's very hard for a person who's focused on pride or ego to fast. It's a very hard thing to do to sort of avoid certain foods. And so they recommend fasting as a way actually out of anger and out of lust, too, as well. These are all connected according to them. And so it's this lack of temperance that will actually lead to a wrong use of anger. So our focus should be how do we sort of restore the right view of temperance, of using the right things at the right time in the right way, and that will sort of be our way out of uh, uh sort of unrational or irrational anger. Okay. So maybe if we can go on to the questions here and then whoever would like to respond first. Um, so when, and we talked about this a little bit, when are people justified in 
taking revenge, if ever. I know we didn't actually speak directly about revenge, but maybe about kind of anger. When are people justified in taking anger? But let's focus now on revenge. Is, is anyone, is there ever a time within your religions that anyone should ever take revenge? Revenge, uh, can I go? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Thanks, Jay Street. Yeah, revenge by itself has a very, very bad and evilish connotation. But if you think that even the revenge, even a bad thing of re like revenge has two sides, uh, one would look at it uh, in those two different lights. One is if you apply anger to revenge, definitely it is it is a um, it is very much an evilish act, and it becomes a very bad vice a person to take a revenge. Avenging anyone is not a good thing for sure. But but at the same time, uh, let's take the scenario where. We are being uh, governed by really very corrupt politicians, let's say. And by virtue of teaching him a lesson, we decide not to vote for him. And we make sure that the person is not governing anymore. He is no longer in the position that he was, where he was doing a lot of bad things and corruption and lying and all these things. So that's, that's, a, that's something a democratic revenge. Let's call it, and it's it it doesn't become a revenge per se, but it becomes a teaching a lesson to the person who's not being fair. So this is something I would look at revenge, the concept of revenge. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was that was insightful. Um, I'm not I'm not altogether sure in uh, the Buddhist scriptures uh, of any example where uh, revenge is framed in a positive light. Um, it seems to me that um, at least two primary uh, negative emotions would, would have to be involved. The first would be, of course, anger, uh, and the second would be pride. Um, and, um, uh, so I don't, I, I just don't know of any example from, uh, from my studies where, uh, where revenge would, would, would be condoned in, in any way. Um, certainly teaching, you know, people, uh, using all sorts of skillful methods, uh, is condoned, uh, and encouraged. Um, but it's usually, you know, supposed to be done from a uh, kind of more, um, you know, uh, calm and insightful and compassionate approach uh, than um, than what we normally think of when we think of the word revenge. Um, and um, so interesting when when you were speaking, uh, Father Adrian, that the uh, there's a, a expression from uh, the Dharmapada, a, a very ancient uh, Buddhist text kind of summarizes a lot of teachings, um, where the, the, uh, the Buddha said, uh, you, you can only conquer hatred with love. Um, and uh, so I think that kind of concept fits, fits here, where um, that kind of uh, pride and anger and, and whatnot would need to be addressed um, on a, in a more type of loving, compassionate type of way uh, than in than in revenge. Now that doesn't mean people get to do whatever they want. You know, that's a different that's a different thing altogether. Uh, here we're talking about you know the emotion involved uh, in, with revenge and not necessarily um, trying to make people um, be responsible for their actions. 
and you know bring them to to a different understanding of you know how they're affecting uh, the environment and the people around them that's one thing uh, but coming at it from the revenge side um, that would be a completely different thing so that's how I would I would understand it so the same as uh, Dr. Barber here in Christianity, I mean, there's, you, I mean, you know, I'm even thinking kind of like, you know, the deepest sort of texts here and my, my big knowledge of them, but there really is no time that revenge is sort of looked at as a good thing. I mean, we do see times, of course, where, where the sort of uh, justice is with the Lord and that's repeated concept throughout scripture that it's kind of that is something that's sort of like God's and that's not our world. And we should not even barely even think to step into that world because as human beings, it's, 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 a, it's an area that we should never go into because every time that a prophet tried to do that or, or another person within scripture, Holy Scripture, or even the history of the church, whenever they tried to do that, they just got into the deeper trouble and into deeper <laughs> session and sin so <laughs> there's there's almost it's kind of like it's, it's out of the vocabulary um it's just automatically thought of as uh, as a as a word but though i mean in our daily lives i don't know what both of you think here but i mean it is i think it's a it's a big concept that i mean a lot of people have to have to deal with too uh, but i mean christianity at least is unanimous in Sort of any reference, I mean, the closest you can get to that is is justice is with the Lord. But again, that leaves you to do nothing, <laughs> almost. Of course, seek justice yourself, too. I mean, we have to have just societies. But, but this idea that I need to come and sort of bring justice to the world through my personal kind of ego kind of upsetting things and, 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 and making things to my own subjective reality, I mean, that's always a problem. So, And then, yeah. Uh... In sort of the East Asian uh, Buddhist way of, of looking at things, um, you know, you you might think that, you know, you're getting justice, right? But, of course, the person who is receive, <laughs> receiving your uh, beneficial revenge uh, is not thinking they're getting justice. They're thinking, you know, they're, they're getting the short end uh, in this deal, which leads into this kind of cycle where you guys, you know, get trapped. And sometimes, you know, that goes on over lifetimes, right? Where like, you know, you're, you're up today and then, you know, the other person's up tomorrow. And, and so we never know when the end of it is. And the only way to end it is, is, you know, through love and compassion. It's, it's certainly not going to be continuing on with, with the cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, we all, uh, we all have a, an idea of, you know, that our, our abilities as humans is very, very limited. So we can, you know, our ability to see the future is, um, uh, is not very good. And so a lot of times things that may look unjust today, tomorrow might have been the greatest thing that ever happened. And we just don't know. And there's no way for yeah. us to to know. Um, so it's it's good if we don't get too caught up in this this whole idea. On a relative level, of course, you know, I mean, everyone wants justice at the court and and so on and so forth, and that's all fine. But you know, on a, on a sort of bigger uh, bigger level or, or, or a deeper level, uh, we have to understand that you know these these things are. Are very limited and our ability with all of it is also quite limited yeah. totally. so, one other thing oh sorry I, Jay, I, sure, go ahead yeah could i just add see normally revenge is also i mean uh, some people take revenge as a wild justice okay something like a wild justice but uh, if you think of revenge in a warfare let's say and it's a retaliation it's a retaliation against the enemies or retaliation against something that itself is causing harm to the good, harm to the society or harm to the community. In that case, retaliation comes wild justice, which has another name called revenge. For example, in the Hindu scriptures, five, seven thousand years ago when we have Goddess Kali, Goddess Durga, 
They have killed the demon out of maternal love for her children. Now that's that's a justice taught to the devil or the demon to protect her children. Same thing, same thing that we see even in the animal kingdom. That a mother with her cub. Um, if you harm, if you try to kill one of the cubs or harm the cubs, the mother is going. That's a wise justice. That's a justice done to the person who himself is actually causing harm to the person or to the animal or to the cub of the mother. So revenge, um, again, I said it has. Otherwise, in a colloquial general term, it is very bad. You don't avenge something. We, you don't harm somebody. You don't hold something in your mind, and then I'm gonna be even with this person. It's like eye for an eye. No, we are. We that is the usual meaning taken by people. When it is a justice done in a wild justice, let's say done to retaliate something or someone who has been. Not good. Who has been hurtful? Who has been harmful to the good of the people, to the entire society or community? That revenge takes a different form. It becomes a justice. It is just. It certainly does not remain that uh, that typical colloquial general understanding of the word revenge. That's all I want to say. No, that's good thing. And actually, um, one of the things. At least, kind of putting the the Christian interpretation of because that is it's I mean it's in different places, but this idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And maybe this is kind of getting onto something. It's is that where you see that in the Christian scriptures and also in the Jewish scriptures, it's in the context of a of a legal setting. So it's not sort of like a person kind of thinking like, oh, this person hurt me, and then I'm going to go take their eye because they took my eye. No, I mean you have to take that person to court. You have to have two witnesses. Uh, that sort of saw that thing happening, which uh, I mean, some people might kind of argue that I mean, the the legal system that's uh, asked for in the law of Moses earlier on in the, in the Old Testament, what we would call, um, it's it, it doesn't allow, allow for a lot of management of justice. But that's the the framework of an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. It's not just like sort of, I have something against my neighbor. You have to bring that neighbor to court, you have to have witnesses, you have to have legal proceedings, and then only after that point can actually sort of that fellow, that charge be made. Um, and even within the Christian tradition, that has been kind of, uh, we said that uh, the law has been fulfilled in the sense that the law of love will usurp what had happened before uh, in the old covenant or the old kind of promise and law of God. So that's different, but maybe let's uh, move into the next question here. Uh, how is anger related to unforgiveness? If anyone wants to go with that. Anger related to forgiveness. Uh, unforgiveness or not forgiving. Forgiveness, unforgiveness. Mm. Maybe there's a better word. I, I don't know if I got the right form there for me. <laughs> not forgiving. <laughs> Anger and unforgiveness, in a way, are absolutely like they are as different as day and night, actually, in a way. But I will, I will, uh, uh, Tony, you go first, and um, let me think over it a little bit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, it, it seems to me that. Um, Anger um, uh, is kind of a foundation for unforgiveness in that um, you holding on to that anger uh, with regard to a particular you know type of incident or, or whatever from a different person uh, is also a way for you to hold on to that person but hold on to that person in negative light um, instead of, you know, letting it go and saying, okay, you know, uh, I'll forgive you. Um, and um, so, so 
the unforgiving part of it doesn't allow you to move outside of your anger. Your anger is what's what's maintaining that uh, that uh, unforgiven um, situation, which means that you're kind of frozen. You're frozen in that negative past event, um, and um, so you're stuck. You know, you're emotionally stuck. Uh, to get beyond that, right? Um, you know, you need to to you know deal with your anger, but you know, and then move to to being able to forgive. Usually, in in Buddhism, um, the way I mean, we have meditational ways that we try to deal with that, but one of the other ways, you know, more kind of um, of um, let's say. Um, uh, uh, cognitive ways of, of dealing with it uh, is through gratitude, right? You start to try to to find, even if it's just little things that, you know, you can be grateful for with regard to whatever the triggering incident was, you know, um, and um, and then try to move from, from, you know, having some gratitude to looking at, well, look at, you know, both sides had to be involved, you can't uh, you can't have this type of a situation all from one from one side, um, and or usually, I mean, yeah, maybe in some you know bizarre event, but you know, generally, you know, two, both sides are involved to some extent, and um, and so in 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 that way, um, so Buddhist texts don't don't talk uh, as much about forgiving per se. Uh, but they do talk about trying to develop uh, gratitude and uh, for for people, even the people who we might at the moment think uh, you know uh, have done us wrong or owe us something or whatever the you know the driving concern is behind the uh, behind the anger situation. Um, so there's actually a, a very interesting. Uh, whole psychology that was developed in Japan um, based on this this idea of developing gratitude. So um, it, it's not very popular over here, but it's it's, it's uh, used quite often over there. And it all comes out of this this Buddhist idea. Yeah. Yeah. Any reflections there, Jay Shri? For sure. Yeah. I was just thinking about it, uh, Father. Anger actually is a part of being human. I take it as very much um, our own, one of our basic uh, emotions. But it doesn't have to control us. Otherwise, it can ruin our life too. Because even um, in, uh, in the world around us, we see that countless people uh, lose uh, their marriages, they're because of anger, they lose their families, they lose their jobs, their businesses, even their health, so anger. And I think that could be one of the reasons why so many people have come up with anger management courses. So yes, <laughs> it's very much in today's society, anger management. Now, anger, unforgiveness and anger go hand in hand. Dealing with unforgiveness is the one that is the root cause of all these losses we suffer. But at the same time, uh, if we convert this anger into something uh, that we want to learn the life-changing strategies, uh, it may work in our favor. And when it starts working in our favor, automatically, very naturally, we start um, getting out of that unforgiving mode or mode and we start developing a sense of gratitude within ourselves. And that also uh, stems from the feeling of forgiveness. So having a sense of gratitude and sense of forgiveness is um, after we control the anger, which could and may ruin our life. So basically, again, it is in our control. 
Now the same thing has been told over and over in in most of, or I would say, all of the Hindu scriptures, that anger is one of the root cause, and unforgiveness is, which is the result of being excessively angry, is the root cause of the self destruction of the person who was angry. So. The first thing is to bring that anger in control. And earlier we talked about revenge. There are many ways of taking a revenge. But if you think revenge is also, from, if you give the, the, what should I say? If you give revenge a beautiful connotation of forgiving, forgiveness, if someone is hurting me and I said, listen, you are hurting me because you yourself are hurt. So by saying that, what I'm doing is I'm forgiving the person who's hurting me. At the same time, my way of avenging his hurting me is a, is a positive, uh, you know, outcome. So I don't know if I made myself clear, but I'm okay. right now understanding what I said. I don't want to be angry and unrevengeful and unforgive, unforgiveness uh, should be there. When I'm angry, I should control it. I should develop that sense of gratitude. And if I understand the other party, and if I feel that this person is hurting me or harming me because this person himself or herself is hurt or doesn't understand that this person is hurting me, that understanding within me automatically gives me that feeling of forgiving that other person. So basically that anger automatically is reduced completely to forgiving the person as well as avenging the person in a very beautiful, positive way. Who knows the person will uh, will be uh, will be wise and and uh, he the person will realize, oh my God, what was I gonna do? Was I going to hurt this person? But this person is so good that that person made me realize that I'm the one who is the hurt party. I'm the one who is the ignorant party. But now I understand. And now I am knowledgeable that I should be doing that. So in a way, anger and unforgiveness, hand in hand, but at the same time, if we again exercise our own control on anger, it can result into forgiveness. It can result into the betterment of the other person or the enemy. Something like that. Um, anger can trigger this at the same time. Human control, the brain control over the anger, and uh, can help you, help all of us. That's great, thank you. Um, can I uh, can I pick up on something she just said? Yeah, in uh, in Buddhism, across all the traditions, uh, there are four meditations um, that are used, um, and these four are called uh, uh, Brahma Vihara. Um, I translated something like exalted stations, right? Uh, two of those, one is uh, loving kindness and one is compassion. Loving kindness is under understood as wanting um, the uh, other person or could be an animal uh, to be having a, a good life. And compassion is wanting them not to suffer. And in these meditations, which lead to very, very deep states of mind. Um, but in these meditations, <clears throat> you move from, you know, people who you respect and, and um, uh, you know, think are, are worthy, honorable people to, you know, people who you, you know, would consider your enemy or your, you know, you, you don't respect. And this is the whole purpose, right? Uh, so you you try to develop the sentiment that you want even them to have a good life, even them to not suffer, because you recognize, as as she was saying, they're hurting too, right? They yes, in the present situation might be very terrible, and the, the two of you had some incident or whatever, but they're still suffering. They're still hurting, 
right? And so we have these meditations uh, that are, you know, supposed to be leading you to, to this um, kind of forgiven place, although they don't use that word particularly, but um, that's the idea, right? Oh, that's great. It's... Tony, Tony, sorry, uh, Father. Father. Tony, I like your idea about the compassion. Your idea in the sense you, what you talked about, compassion. Actually, by releasing anger or resentment or whatever we have, I think once a person starts uh, feeling empathy and compassion, and sometimes it's possible that you actually develop affection for the person who wronged you. Yes. So, which, which is very good. This is an out excellent outcome. The person controls the anger and starts feeling compassionate towards the other person. So basically, forgiving that person is uh, is uh, excellent for both. You know, the one who has hurt you or wronged you, and the person who gets angry but controls it and develops compassion. So the, it's a it's a win win situation. Or both. Yeah. yeah, it's also great for the karma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like kind of both of your reflections here in terms of. Uh, I think in some ways it, it's interesting because within the Christian tradition, for example, you have this uh, phrase from Scripture, and you might have heard at a wedding. It's like a typical kind of wedding reading to pick that love is patient, love is kind, um, but there's one part that says that love always hopes. The fact that if we're kind of like loving or loving, loving kindness for someone is we look at any person here in the world and we, or I mean, anything, and we sort of say like, you have potential. And that I think is the beginning of, uh, I mean, developing a love um, for that person. I mean, we, we would talk about, we would frame it in terms of seeing the image of God in that person that whoever they are, they were created in the image of God. And so even though they've done these terrible things to me or to other people, it's love always hopes. Because, I mean, how can we not sort of love a person unless we see the good in that person? And so, of course, it's not sort of like deceiving ourselves. We're not sort of going to be like, give, I mean, we pick up the phone and someone from Canada Revenue Agency "Quote unquote" is calling us, and <laughs> we we hope that they have the best kind of uh, intentions in mind. But I'm sure there's some good in that person trying to scam us on the other line. <laughs> maybe maybe a final question for us here, uh, just to, for us to wrap up. We'll wrap up in a few minutes here, but. Uh, Actually, you know what, instead of having a question, why don't we just uh, kind of have a little bit of time just to, yeah, any final reflections on this or how we sort of apply this daily to our lives? And I mean, our viewers have already seen uh, the many sort of areas where actually, I mean, there's a lot of links that, I mean, I think all of us were not necessarily even aware of and some deeper perspectives that we've all went, in, who went into through this discussion. Uh, could I go now? Oh, yeah, of course, Chief, yeah, thanks. And, yeah, I think, um, Father Adrian and Tony, uh, the first person that I would forgive is myself. Because at any given moment, I think I'm doing the best I can. So, best is to forgive myself because many times, Anger is a helpful emotion, yes, but many times I could be doing wrong to others in uh, being angry. At the same time, when I'm ready and conscious about it, I want to be kind to myself. And thereby I will control or rather manage my anger. When I'm ready to forgive myself, that will also uh, trigger forgiving others because just as I'm flawed and I'm imperfect, so, are, so is everyone else. So why should we hold on to someone's mistake and get angry when we know that we are also flawed and equally imperfect as others are? 
So for, by forgiving myself, I'm forgiving, or by learning to forgive myself, I'm also forgiving, learning to forgive others. And when I'm doing this, uh, like Tony spoke about compassion and you spoke about love earlier, directing or redirect my thoughts towards these beautiful emotions and sentiments of a human mind, I would say that um, challenging my negative thoughts and using these compassion and love would be wonderful to develop that positive thinking within myself and get rid of the bitterness it, which could cloud my own uh, rationale and my own logic, right? So I would, I would redirect my thoughts. And uh, by redirecting my thoughts, perspective would change also. My perspective would change uh, to looking at many uh, flaws of others. Uh, see, we are very um, quick in finding flaws in other people. But uh, we forget that we are equally human like they are and rather they are also equally human like we are and they are also, you know, entitled to err just as we are. But we forget our errors, we forget our flaws and we always point out their flaws. So, you know, these are the things I would say that anger is causing and... Um, Instead of just depending on the scriptures and all that, let's learn from them. Let's imbibe some of the beautiful concepts that are narrated in those scriptures. But I want to live in the present. Earlier, I gave an example of the democratic anger or democratic revenge. It's very much applicable in today's world. If you find that some people are being very unjust and unkind, to the deserving people, then we, we have to, we have a way to remove that person, have to exercise and employ that way, remove that person. And that is not revenge. So anger, revenge, unforgiveness, all these terms which are generally regarded as very strong negative terms, if we look at it with a little bit of different lens, rather, um, we may be able to employ the in concepts, a little bit of rational and logic to our own benefit and for the benefit of the society. That's how I would look at it. Yeah, thanks, Thank you. Any final thoughts, there, Dr. Barber, that you want to add before we kind of close off here? Well, um, the Buddha is perfect, and personally, I am perfectly imperfect. So... <laughs> Uh, but what's what's kind of uh, st uh, struck me about our our uh, conversation here uh, is uh, that um, you know first of all uh, anger uh, and of course the other uh, emotions are something that that is so very human. It's not a Christian thing. It's not a Buddhist thing. It's not a Hindu thing. It's or a Taoist thing or whatever. Right? It's a human thing. And what all of our traditions are doing, even though the theology is quite different between the three of us, uh, but what of all of them are trying to do is trying to tell us two very important things. One is you have to be greater than yourself. Right? Rise up above Sorry, Tony. We're going to be there for a sec. Okay. Do you mind what repeating I, that last? About 30 seconds ago, if that's okay, because it was just a, such a good point. So, <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm humbled. Uh, what I was trying to it. say was is that even uh, though the the sort of theological stance between Catholics and, and Hindus and Buddhists and whatnot is quite different, and the way that we understand the human situation um in terms of um, sort of the transcendental or the greater picture of things is also quite different. But what all, all of these traditions are doing is they're saying two things that are, that are very much the same. And that, that is, is that the human condition when uh, experiencing these negative emotions uh, and of which anger is one of the primary ones, 
You know, we have to rise above this. We have to be greater than ourselves. And the way that we do this is through some sort of discipline. Now, it might be meditational. It might be prayer. It might be, you know, getting a different understanding, you know, different perspective on things. Uh, it might be by cultivating, uh, you know, uh, different uh, attitudes through our devotions or, or through our practices and whatnot. But they're all saying the same thing. We have to be more than than our, our kind of, you know, base self. And the way to get there is through some sort of spiritual discipline. And so in a lot of ways, um, it seems to me that this, this is a, a very kind of, you know, productive conversation because it's pointing to something that is very much human, right? And not necessarily, you know, for this religion or for, for Eastern people or for Western people or, or all these kind of categories that we use to, to you know, define and distinguish things. Um, but at the base of it all, we're basically the same people. <laughs> right. I mean, going at it from this anthropological perspective, I mean, in some senses, it's, uh, I mean, that's the great sort of insight that religion provides to anthropology because by itself, it's just sort of an analyzing human beings without this spiritual component and definitely missing something. So, but, yeah. but thank you both. Uh, again, uh, for all your help, uh, Jay Shri, uh, I apologize here again that uh, you're only able to join me by phone. So I think every time you speak in the video, my face will will come up. So, but you're, but uh, Jay Shri is here on, on on the good old trusty iPhone. So <laughs> thank you very much both of you, and uh, we'll be uh, stopping right here the recording. All right, it was a pleasure. Tony, thank you. Father Adrian, thank you. And you both have a wonderful evening. Thank Same to you. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao.